Part of how we're going to lay this out today is um, Dan is an economist um, and does the strategy and analytics for our office. And so we each year do a international export sort of strategy and where global business development, which is the team um, within OEDIT that we work under, um, where we go in the world. So this kind of uh, lays that out and and why we make those decisions. And then I'll talk about the advanced industry programs and the opportunities for entrepreneurs. And then Nicole, who runs our international programs, will talk about how the strategy ties together and then some um, additional funding opportunities that you can take advantage of on the international side. So, um, but along the way, I think that we welcome questions and you know stop us, we want this to sort of be interactive. I know Dan's stuff is he likes data, so you'll see that there's a lot of data and stuff. So if you have questions about it, then yeah, just ask. So thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Yeah, so as Katie mentioned, my name is Dan Savetti. I'm the manager of strategy and analytics within uh, the global business development division of the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. Uh, <laughs> a lot to say. Uh, basically, I pull together data from different sources that. Uh, help us focus our efforts uh, throughout the year and when we're engaging with companies, being able to get them data on uh, you know, cost comparisons between Colorado and maybe Washington State or some other uh, competitor as well. Um, so just a, a brief, sort of give a little bit of a background about our unit uh, and why we sort of think data and strategy is uh, a really good place to start is that we, the Office of Economic Development is 70 people large, which sounds pretty pretty good, but um, if you look to other states, especially the ones that we're often competing with, you're looking at a, a, a workforce of about 1,000 people doing the same job that we are with 70. And our division specifically, which is 10 people, you might have about 70 in another of our competitor states. So we're a very lean team. We don't have a lot of time and a lot of resources to just throw around and uh, there's basically opportunity around the globe. So what we try to do up front is to run a lot of data and strategy and analytics to say, okay, well, based on what we're seeing, based on this data, we really should focus our efforts in these particular markets. So that's the main thing that I'm going to show you guys today is uh, sort of our two major projects for the year uh, is our FDI attraction strategy and our export strategy. So they're essentially two separate documents that try to pinpoint some of our interactions a little more than just taking sort of a broad shotgun shot across the, the globe. Um, so here they are, those are the front covers of these two. So getting into it, we'll talk sort of about, about our goal uh, that we, we think about when we first start on these strategies each year, uh, then talk about the methodology we used, and then talk about some of the findings that we saw through this uh, exercise. Cool. So basically, as I was just saying a little bit before, we're, we're trying to really focus our efforts. So we're, we're trying to guide the selection of international engagements. And, and our office, I should mention ahead of time, runs uh, trade and investment missions, uh, either with the governor or our executive director uh, or other leadership within our office to these international markets, both to help Colorado companies that are here and are looking to expand to meet with distributors, buyers, uh, other joint venture partnerships uh, to help them expand their international market. And then at the same time, we meet with companies abroad to tell them how great Colorado is and how they should move some of their operations uh, if they're looking into expanding or relocating uh, to our state versus, say, Washington, California, uh, Ohio. Um, so trying to guide those international engagements by figuring out sort of these three key questions. So the first one is, from which uh, countries are companies uh, expanding in the industries that we see as relevant to Colorado's economic growth? And so we'll get into that a little bit uh, in the next methodology section. Uh, into which countries are international investors putting their funds uh, for sort of emergent uh, industries like clean tech, um, health tech, like sort of those intersections of software and sort of a more traditional industry that aren't as well defined in our data as we'd like. Uh, and then third, and this sort of gets to that uh, export promotion side, uh, in which countries are people buying or importing the products that Colorado is good at manufacturing? So to answer those three questions, I'll start with the FDI uh, attraction strategy. So, um, yes? What is an FDI? I'm, that's a very Sorry. good question. No, 
Uh, foreign, it's direct foreign direct investment. <laughs> I apologize. I get so used to just using the acronym. Uh, it's foreign direct investment. So a company, uh, let's say in China, uh, coming to the U.S. and setting up operations, hiring people within the market to, you know, produce a product, or, uh, provide a service, something like that. Any other questions or? Okay. Um, so for the foreign direct investment side. Uh, we start at the point of uh, which occupations uh, are sort of most, um, what, what do you want to target the most? So we, there's, a Mercer, there's a study in 2016 with the Mercer Group in our office that looked at the uh, occupations in which Colorado was already uh, more densely hiring than the rest of the nation uh, that were projected to grow quicker and, and have a lot of demand in the future that were high, highly skilled and higher uh, paying. And so we sort of focused on those at the beginning and then looked at the industries that were not only hiring those occupations, but also were also very strong in Colorado, were projected to grow, uh, uh, were complementary to the programs and the governor's priorities that uh, a little bit more subjective there, but that we also thought was important to to focus on for this uh, for this report, um, and then from there looked at sort of uh, so foreign direct investment project volume. So we have databases that tell us when a company in uh, country A makes an investment into country B, uh, and we could see you know the industry that was made in, uh, the amount of jobs that created, the amount of capital that was expended. So we tracked projects like that. Uh, for about 16 different industries that were aligned with sort of uh, what we call the NAICS codes, North American Industrial Classification System Code. Essentially, it's a federal uh, level designation that tells you, um, you know, your code 3341621 uh, computer manufacturing. And we could see that uh, a, a company in that industry was making an uh, investment into a certain country. Um, so we looked at those industries, looked at where they were generating projects. We also looked at, on the other side, where investors worldwide were placing their money into certain companies for certain industries. Um, and then on the export side, it was uh, the size and growth of import volumes, both globally and coming from the US and also coming from Colorado. So looked at several different metrics across both those reports, um, did some weighted ranking, uh, did some scoring based on those metrics, um, and then categorized our markets to say, all right, well, based on the size growth, uh, we should categorize it as one of our top priorities. Um, but then also we have, we've seen a lot of Colorado connection in that industry, in that market. So uh, we're gonna categorize it a little bit differently. So basically the last, the tools that we funneled down to through the analysis were sort of country lists for a specific industry. So in this one we're showing electronics uh, and then also what we call SKU tables which look at each uh, country's um, FDI outbound projects that they were generating and said, well, where is the largest uh, share uh, coming from as far as which, which industry it was in. Uh, so for the country list, we, we essentially we say, okay, we know that we're wanting to run a, a, a mission uh, or help promote exports in a given industry for a given product, which countries are the largest for that market and which countries are growing the most. Uh, and that's what the country list will tell us. On the other side, we could say, okay, we, we know that we want to run a mission to uh, China you know, which industry should we focus on? So what we could do is compare sort of the share of the market in that country going to a specific industry with how that industry, uh, how its share looks across the globe. So in this case, about 15% of China's outbound projects are in electronic manufacturing. Whereas for the rest of the world, it's about 5%. And that's, uh, and we have it shaded so it kind of shows um, how that difference uh, 
how severe that difference is, the darker, the more uh, further from the average it is. Um, so that is a, a case in which, you know, we should focus on electronics going there. So here's some of the broad level findings. So we, we go through this process, we make the country list, we make the skew tables, um, and that's to help guide us. What this is showing is sort of how many of the lists a country makes uh, for the outbound project generation. So if you can see here, the United Kingdom's at the top, they made, we essentially analyzed 25 different industries and they made all 25 country lists because the UK is by and far the largest project generator uh, besides the US, but this is all international, um, for uh, moving across borders and setting up operations. So it would not make sense for us to ignore them offhand essentially for any market because they, we, we have a small team, we need to go to where the action is occurring and right now it's occurring in the UK. So the, the darker the shade, basically the more lists that the country made. Um, as you can see, the way we list it is it goes down to uh, five lists. So Taiwan is the last one there, it made five different lists. Um, and we did the same thing for the export promotion markets. Uh, as you can see, they're, they're pretty similar to the ones we have for the FDI. Uh, and that's something that we get into with our general findings and that's that sort of the highest income, most populous, and most economically advanced countries in the world. Uh, they generate projects, they uh, attract funding, and they buy imports at such a level that it doesn't make sense to ignore them for most of our industries and most of the products that we're trying to help bolster. Um, these are mostly southern, western, and northern Europe, so UK, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, uh, the Nordic countries of uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, Denmark. These are all really important. We call the Anglosphere, so you're looking at the UK, Ireland, uh, Australia, uh, Canada are all very important. Uh, and then a little further east, Israel, China, Japan, uh, India, and the Asian Tigers, which are South Korea, um, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So, um, so these are all markets where we should be engaging, you know, with a frequency of about one every one once a year to once every two years. Our engagement should be really strong for our office because we're looking at um, the most activity, and we don't have the um, capacity to be wholesale leaving these out in any in, in, a, in any respect. And then areas of lesser activity, so outside of those I just named, especially Southeast Asia, uh, sort of Eastern Europe, especially the Balkan area, so um, sort of uh, Croatia, uh, Romania, those types. Um, they are, they're starting to gain a little bit of traction, especially in the export strategy, and we believe that their markets are sort of building internally, but they don't yet have the business volume uh, and the business strength to be uh, moving across borders at the same uh, speed as the, the sort of stronger markets. Um, so we think that they should be incorporated with a frequency of maybe one to every three to five years. Um, and we need to be tracking them closely to sort of see how they're long term going to incorporate into our strategy. And then on top of all of those uh, analyses, we also sort of more loosely and subjectively thought about some of these other institutional um, considerations that we need to take into account. So visa policy is not the same for every country coming to the US. So we have specific uh, sort of subsets of visas like the treaty trader, treaty investor uh, visas, E4, E5. Uh, and these ones allow uh, investors or um, traders that are coming from a specific list of countries that we've uh, published through the um, through the custom through customs, um, they allow for sort of a streamlined process and uh, a longer <coughs> window of uh, visa retainment. So it's easier for them to come here than say someone from India or China, which are not on that list, uh, and therefore it'd be easier to attract that investment. So we think about stuff like that, um, sort of 
you know, what universities are in the markets we're looking at, uh, sort of how have we previously engaged in the market, has it been five years since we've gone to a market that should be engaged with frequently. Um, so there's a lot more than just the analysis I just showed you, but that's the main beat, uh, main part of it, and then we also consider this. So thank you. Do you guys have any questions, uh, or we can move on to the next part. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Dan loves data, so. Again, uh, my name is Katie Waslinger, and I run the Advanced Industries programs for our office. And I'm going to talk about our different funding opportunities, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Nicole, who will talk about the international opportunities that you can take advantage of, which sort of uh, relate to that strategy that Dan just went through. And I, just as way of background, our office hasn't always used a data-driven strategy approach. So we used to just kind of cast this <laughs> wide net and think like, oh, we should be going to Germany or we should be going to Singapore. And it's it's not always effective when you're in a market where it doesn't make sense if there's no signal. So that's why we have that strategy now that we can overlay into our funding programs and then really maximize taxpayer dollars in an effective way. Um, so I'm the money person and I'm going to talk about how you can take advantage of all of our state funding. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background, talk about the opportunities, and then um, show you some of the return on investment and the impact of the program. So how many people are familiar with the advanced industry programs? Okay, so a few of you, great. Um, so some of this is going to be a little redundant. Some of it will be, I think, good just by way of background. Um, I like to talk about the blueprint. It was under the previous administration um, by Governor Hickenlooper, um, but it kind of lays the foundation of how this program was first started. So um, he went around when he was early in office, um, did a bottom-up community uh, approach, cross-agency collaboration, brought together stakeholders to identify these areas in the blueprint to focus on. So building a business-friendly environment, retain, grew, retain, grow, and recruit companies, which is what uh, two of our industry development managers do in our office. They work to recruit companies. So if you read the Denver Post, uh, the State Economic Development Commission meets once a month and approves these uh, major expansion projects. So Slack came from the Silicon Valley. They did set up operations in downtown Denver. That's our office that's working typically with Denver Metro Economic Development Corporation. Or if companies are looking, um, they'll work with Jessica. Our office works with uh, Jessica's office to see if Longmont's a place for some of these um, places to land as well. And then increase access to capital, which is what the advanced industry program was created to do, is to um, increase funding to early stage startups. Um, create and market a stronger Colorado brand. So early on, that green triangle was created and branded through the state, and I think it was shared so businesses could put that and say, we're a Colorado business. Educate and train the workforce of the future, and then cultivate innovation and technology. So those were some of the goals. Um, our office focuses on 14 industries. Uh, we have seven advanced industries that we focus on. They're typically knowledge-based uh, jobs, um, industries, uh, and they're, they're high paying. Uh, so advanced manufacturing, aerospace, bioscience, life sciences, electronics, energy, natural resources, that includes clean tech, uh, infrastructure engineering, and technology and information. Um, if anyone's interested in reading more, here's the legislation that was passed. So this is state funding. Um, some of it's gaming revenue. Some of it comes from uh, what's called Senate Bill 47. And Dan mentioned those uh, NAICS codes. I don't, I don't know who makes these statutes, but uh, <laughs> they're all listed. But it, some of the funding comes from biotech and clean tech. And when those industries grow, then our fund grows. Um, so here's our program objectives. So drive innovation and foster entrepreneurship, support technologies that cross into multiple advanced industry sectors, accelerate commercialization, 
um, encourage public-private partnerships, increase access to early stage capital, and then increase exports. So there's different levels of our funding. So I'm going to talk about these more in detail. So proof of concept, which is you know that you know initial early stage R&D development, proving that the technology works. Then early stage capital retention, where you either spin that technology out of a university or you are an early stage company um, where you have a product that you're commercializing. And then uh, we have a, an investment tax credit that I'll talk about. Uh, and then, of course, we want people to, as they expand, um, get the product out of here and export it to uh, different international markets. And then we have our collaborative infrastructure funding, which is for large scale projects when you sort of graduate to that. So, and then our STEP program, which, you know, again, Nicole's going to talk about our international programs. So some of the eligibility, so if you are in the proof of concept phase, and again, I'm going to go into the details of those, um, to be eligible, you have to apply through a Colorado approved research institution. So that would include a technology transfer office at any of our major universities, a federal lab, uh, and then that the technology is innovative and disruptive to one of our advanced industries. So uh, we do have collaborative partners that we work uh, with closely in this program. So we work with our seven advanced industry trade associations, which are listed here. So their involvement is that they are typically member-based organizations. I encourage you, if you are in any of these sectors, to get involved with them. Go to one of their networking events. Uh, there are people that can help you with challenges, um, there's founders and CEOs that attend, there's also uh, different, I would say, C-level executives that are there too that have grown companies to, to scale so that um, you have you can find those opportunities if you need help. Um, or they can you know guide you to someone, like if you're a bioscience company and you need to, you're not sure of a regulatory pathway with the FDA, they have some expertise there that can help you. Um, and then we also have um, reviewers that, you have a question? Yeah, does the Metro Denver Aerospace and Aviation um, Organization, does that just work with Denver-based aerospace and aviation companies or Colorado? Colorado, it's a nine county region that they focus on. But I mean, certainly if you have any questions around the state, they work with the, like the Colorado Space Coalition and different organizations like that that can connect you to um, other entities. And then, um, yeah, as I was saying, we have reviewers, so we can be business, technical, and financial experts that vet all of our applications. I'll talk about that here in a minute as well. Um, and now I'm just going to do a deep dive into each of these opportunities so that you know how they work. Um, so our proof of concept is, again, that early um, proving that the technology works. You have to apply through a technology transfer office at a research institution. Uh, you can ask for $150,000. All of our funding is a matching grant with cash, so you have to have $50,000 of cash um, if you're in this stage. Typically, people um, working at a research institution are a recipient of federal, federal funding that they're um, working on, so they can you can match it with um, any federal funds. And then uh, early stage capital retention is for early stage startup companies. So you can request uh, $250,000 uh, is the matching requirements are flipped. So you, it's a two to one match. So you have to have $500,000 of cash. The cash can come from uh, federal funding. So SBIR, STTR, uh, DOE, DOD, NSF, NIH, any federal agency. Um, but you can only match the unspent portion of your award. So Say you receive a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar SBIR grant, and you've already drawn maybe five hundred of it down. You can match the remaining two hundred and fifty, but you have to raise an additional two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But it can come from angel investment, venture capital, if you're ready to be funded. I think what's really great about this funding is that you know often people are um, not investable yet by um, VC or even getting receiving an angel investment. So people are, they'll come to us to seek funding and we step in, we get them to those specific milestones that um, an investor is looking for. We fill that gap and then we get them to those milestones and then a, a 
uh, investor will say, now you're ready for us. And they step in and start making investments. So that's what's, I think, uh, nice about this program. Um, and it, some of the eligibility there is that you have to be headquartered in Colorado or at least 50% of your employees here, less than $10 million of annual revenue and less than $20 million of third party capital raised. And I know as a startup, you're like, I just wish that I had $1 million of, um, of revenue. <laughs> so um, I, those are a little bit high, but we try to build a balanced portfolio. So, uh, you know, amazingly enough, we do have had, have had companies in the past who have raised $19 million right under the cusp. And people say, well, why does a company that has $19 million need state funding? This goes through such a heavily vetted process and um, is reviewed by those business technical and financial experts that sometimes having that sort of state stamp of approval um, can help leverage additional funding in the future. And then our collaborative infrastructure grant is for large scale projects. I know infrastructure can be misleading because you know oftentimes manufacturers come to me and say, oh, we need to you know build out our manufacturing space and put equipment into our facility. But that is not the purpose of this, this funding. It's really to build a statewide asset where you know, it's, it could be like a consortium, for example, where people come together. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, we just funded the AMIT Alliance, which is part, in partnership with the uh, uh, Colorado Clean Tech Industry Association, a company called Vartega, which recycles carbon fiber, and then CSU, and then EWI, which is in Loveland. And so there's three centers of excellence, essentially. One of them is at the Colorado School of Mines. They just launched this HP 580 jet fusion printer. Uh, industry can come in and work on that printer. Um, in fact, we made a really great connection with a company who's um, printing a prosthetic um, in Windsor, Colorado. They were sending that to, and they were printing it out of carbon fiber. They were sending that work to North Carolina. They just found out that they can print it here at the Colorado School of Mines using nylon, So, and it's much lighter than carbon fiber. So that's one um, opportunity that industry can go work at the Colorado School of Mines. And then um, CSU will have um, a robot that's uh, deployed there, they haven't, um, it hasn't come yet and been installed yet, but as industry you can go do work there and then EWI is a partner and then Vartega will also have some. But the point is, is that Colorado companies can go and use these assets that are now stood up in, in the state. And I have other examples too if you're interested in hearing about them. But the matching funds, um, same thing, it's two to one. So the minimum request can be $50,000. Our largest award was two and a half million that we, we granted in 2015 around 3D printing, which was sort of when 3D printing, 3D print, printing has been around for a long time, but you know, it was sort of when it was emerging in, here in Colorado. So, you know, another thing about this program is that we're trying to always keep Colorado relevant and at the forefront of innovation and emerging technologies. So that's um, why I always get excited about this program because we we tend to start funding really emerging in industries that can grow here in Colorado and help our economy. Do you have a question? Um, the state did a two point five million dollar grant for a company. So um, yeah. So it wasn't to a company, it was to, um, it's called ADAPT, the Alliance for the Development of Additive Processing Technologies. And it's at the Colorado School of Mines and essentially it's a consortium um, of Colorado companies and what they're doing is characterizing 3D um, alloys. And the partners in it were Lockheed Martin put 3.1 million, Ball Aerospace put a half a million, Faustin put a half a, half a million, Manufacturer's Edge was a partner, so large, sums of money, a lot of stakeholders, and essentially Colorado companies can participate in the consortium, get access to that data. Um, they've expanded it into um, Utah now where they're um, working on composites, but it's really open source shared data. So <clears throat> I, I think that's exciting because you know the model typically is if, I mean Lockheed could do that themselves, but they're not gonna share that data across the country. So it's a really unique opportunity for Colorado companies that are in that space to participate. Uh, and then we have the investment tax credit. So I don't run this program. Um, I'll have the contact information for the person that does run it at the end of the, the um, slide deck, but um, this is a really great opportunity if you are applying for advanced industry funding because it can help you leverage um, an, invest, an investor 
and investment. So you can tell the investor that they can receive a 25 to 30% tax credit up to a $50,000 investment. Uh, here's some of the parameters. Um, the company has to be uh, less than 10 million of total um, non-revenue funding, 5 million in annual revenue, and operating and generating revenue for uh, less than five years. So um, I will tell you that this is $750,000. This is fully exhausted by June. It's on a calendar year. It opens on January 1st, and again, fully exhausted by June, which is the end of our fiscal year. So take advantage of this as soon as possible. So the investor has to get qualified, and then it's on a, and the investment's on a, um, it's for a Colorado investor. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to share again the contact information for a person. But I can tell you, and they're mutually exclusive to the advanced industries funding. So you don't have to be a recipient of an advanced <coughs> industry award to receive the tax credit. And we have one company, I would say, that raised, I think, $1.3 million with a significant amount of investors. So it is impactful and can bring in a lot of investment into your company and help you grow. And then I'm going to um, turn it over to Nicole, who's going to talk about our export programs and the funding that you can take advantage of. Um, I always say, I don't think it's too late to ever think about exporting. You know, if you're just launching your product or your technology, you still want to, I think, be thinking ahead um, down the road how you're going to grow your business and if exporting is going to be in your equation. Uh, but, you know, businesses, I always say, are super myopic. You're always heads down. I'm trying to do my thing. And we there's a lot of state funding that you can take advantage of that helps offset the costs of doing business, either domestically growing your company in Colorado or international business um, and it's the difference between continuing to do R&D work or go into an international market and sometimes people find that once they go into the international market and get contracts and connections with suppliers and distributors it helps them them really scale and grow so I'm gonna have Nicole come up and talk and then I'll come back and talk about um, the impact of the program and then I'll answer any questions Thank you. Hi, I'm Nicole Gunkel. I run the International Grants Programs here at OEDIT. Um, so I'll go over the three grant programs that we have to offer through our office, and then I'll also talk briefly about the SBA. If you haven't heard of them yet, they're a great resource, especially for small companies looking for help with loans. Um, so the first award, uh, the Export Accelerator Grant or AI Export Grant, um, you have to be in one of the advanced industries that Katie mentioned um, a few slides ago to apply for this award. Um, both this and the STEP Grant, which I'll get to, they offset the cost of your international business meetings or if you're going to trade shows to promote your products, you can apply um, to get funding to offset those costs. Um, eligibility, you can be new to export or you can be market expansion, um, either or. You do have to show a profit within the last year for this grant. Um, we require matching funds as well. The max award we can give under this is 15000 but that means you also have to spend 15000 of your money to either go to a trade show or on your international business meetings. Our cycle for this, it's July 1st through June 30th. Um, we ask though when you apply for this that you apply at least four to six weeks, I'd say six to eight, if you really want to secure funding, um, or sooner. We'll always take applications sooner. Our Global Consultant Network, this somewhat ties into the AI export. Um, if you're in advanced industry, you can also use our network. So we have 15 um, consultants across the world in different markets. Um, what they do is they help you with um, issues you might have in that country. So if you are interested in Japan, you've never been there before, you want to know how well your product's going to do in the market, you can um, pay the $500 up front, and then we will connect you with our consultant in Japan. They can do a whole market research report for you, tell you kind of the ins and outs of the market, um, especially things like tariffs or different cultural norms that you wouldn't be used to. And that way you know better whether or not it's a market for you. Um, if you've already chosen a market, you're kind of working in it, you're struggling a little bit, they can help with things like set you up with distributors in that area, um, help you get more contacts um, so you can be better successful in the market. Um, 
This has the same requirements as AI export. You have to show profit uh, within the last year. You have to be an advanced industry company. And the last one, the state trade expansion program. So this is funded in part by the SBA, um, who I will also talk about later. Um, offsets the same cost as AI export, both your international business meetings and trade shows. The unique thing about STEP, though, is that we go as a state to four different trade shows every year. And when we go to the trade show, we pay for all the booth costs. We pay for the design, the furniture, and the booth. And we give companies a travel stipend to attend with us. So it's a really good deal. Um, trade shows can be really expensive for companies to go to. I mean, you could look 10, 20,000 would be a low ball for a company to go to a trade show. And here you're basically breaking even if you send one person to the trade show. Four step. Um, the good thing about this, you don't have to be an advanced industry, you can be any industry. You don't need to show a profit in the last year, um, and you can also still be a market expansion or new to the entry. Um, on our website, um, which if you're interested, I can give you my card and I can send you the links, you'll see that we both have applications for our specific trade shows, um, but we also have a general application. So you can go to any trade show in the world, um, or you can still do your international business meetings. Um, generally, our application cycle is October to August. Um, we ask for this that you still apply about four weeks in advance. You can apply sooner if you like to plan ahead and want to make sure that funding is available for you. Does that make sense? Okay. So before I sit down, um, I brought a handful of these brochures today. Um, the SBA is our partner for STEP, um, but they also have a lot of loan programs. I believe at least over 20 different programs. Um, some are related to export, some are related to um, just general development. Um, for example, their export ones um, will help you if you get an international order and you can't fill it because you know, it's so large that you don't have that capital on hand. They can help you get a loan. Um, and the great thing about them is a lot of their loans are guaranteed by the SBA. So if you're struggling to get that money directly with the bank, the SBA can step in and say, we will guarantee. Um, and in some cases, they're guaranteeing up to 90% of your loan backed by the SBA. And that really helps the bank feel more comfortable about loaning you the money um, and could be a good resource. So feel free at the end, I have quite a few of these if you want more information and I can also connect you with our partners at the SBA here. Okay, any questions? Is there any program like about imports in any industry? Let's say a business or an investor in Europe wants to do business with Colorado. So we have our global business development managers help if they're moving locations to Colorado or they're interested in the Colorado market. Um, we, our programs do not help with imports coming in though. So all of our awards are only for Colorado companies. Um, they're the same requirements as Katie's where you have to be 50% employees here or headquarters here. Um, so we don't help foreign companies with their imports into the state. Um, could you expand a little bit? You said that Colorado companies can go in the state yes. to international trade shows. Yes. That'd be like really high interest to us. So what is? How does that work? What market are you in? Drones. Drones. Okay. We don't. Yeah, I can go into that a little more. So the four shows we went to this year, um, starting in October. So we went to Medica, which is medical device show in Germany. We're going to JEC next month, and that's a composite show. Um, Hanover Mess has a huge advanced manufacturing show. We'll be there in April. And then we're doing a renewable energy one in September. So, yeah, we're going to plug one of those. Yeah. Um, but we add new shows every year. Um, and if we aren't going to a show you're interested in, you can still apply for general funding. And that's not, you don't have to have a booth for general funding. If you want to go and walk the show, that's okay too. Um, so then you're not taking on the cost of a booth. OEDIT does space symposium yeah. every year down in Colorado Springs. Yeah. I don't know if there's opportunities for companies with that. 
So we wouldn't be able to give our funding for you to go there because it's still in Colorado? Right. I was just saying um, generally are there opportunities yes. for mm -hmm. Colorado companies to leverage ODAT's presence at Space Symposium? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what I thought at one point would be export grants that you were doing an international show that have to be, be held in the U.S. that still qualified. Yeah, so that is the one exception um, because we know certain shows do rotate around the world. Um, however, we require at least 50% international attendance at a domestic show um, in order to qualify it. The exception is um, international buyers programs. So the Department of Commerce has these shows um, only in the U.S. usually, um, where they bring large delegations of buyers for really niche um, industries. If they're going to those, yeah, we can help fund those. Any other questions? Um, just, this isn't specific to the state trade, but for all these grants, advanced industries grants, is this, renew is this funding from the state get renewed every year? Or is this something that uh, is ongoing just for till who knows when? Yeah, so advanced industries one. So the first two programs I went over are state funded and they do get renewed every year. Okay. Um, the for funding amount is variable. Um, STEP we apply for every year, every soon to be every two years. And again, that's contingent on that we win that funding. And then for advanced industry funding, um, it's in statute until 2024. Okay. So that legislation expires then, which we'll be starting to work on the reauthorization of it. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about the impact of the program so that you can see how these taxpayer dollars have been uh, utilized. So. Um, since uh, the program statute actually was enacted in 2013, we didn't do our first cycle until 2014 that fall. Um, there's $68 million of grants that have been um, funded or deployed to date. There's 457 projects. We've created um, over 1,500 jobs and retained 15, 1,500 jobs, and we've leveraged $794 million back into the state. So I would say that's a pretty nice return. Um, these are some of the top line metrics that we focus on. We also focus on uh, you know, patents, um, any IP that's been developed as well, new companies that are, have been created. Uh, so I, I would say not bad um, return on investment for um, what, we're, what we're doing in the state. Um, and then for the tax inv investment tax credit, so 86 companies have been approved to date, 4.1 million in total tax credits have been given to 271 investors with a total of 19 million in total investments made. So. And then um, for Nicole's, uh, the export uh, component, so 870,000 in grants funded, 110 projects funded, and then uh, 12.9 million in immediate export sales. So we always are tracking how many export sales are made. Um, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but our state funding for the AI export program is only $300,000. Um, we did go through a funding cut, um, so it's now at 175. So we do try to offset the, the funding with our SBA funding, which that we've steadily been increasing every year. We received $480,000 last year and now um, we're hoping to get six hundred thousand dollars this year, so <laughs> we're competitive. All these we see all these states performing and, and um, deploying funding, and we're like, well, we're just going to be, we're going to, you know, compete with that money, <laughs> money too. So, um, and mostly, like again, the SBA stuff that they focus on is really utilization of the funding. So. Um, and then the Global Consultant Network, um, 340,000 of cost savings, 102 companies serviced, 162 activities performed. And again, just to emphasize what Nicole said, you know, paying $500 for a market research report that can cost you anywhere between five and $10,000 is, that's nothing. And also, that $500 can help make the determination if that's the market that you're in versus like, oh, I'm gonna fly, you know, to the UK and then you find out I should not even be here and so that will help uh, mitigate any risk to you 
And then our state trade expansion program, 1.2 million in projects funded, 135 companies. We've completed 15 trade shows. So um, again, to answer you know, through your question, if there is a drone focused uh, trade show that you wanna attend in another country or a conference, then just contact Nicole and she can help you um, with that funding opportunity. And then here's our contact information. Well, um, Nicole and mine is on there. Andrew, the tax, uh, Dan isn't on there, but Rama, um, she's not here today. She works on the program with me. So, uh, but thanks again for um, having us, Jessica and Sergio. Uh, we appreciate it. We Can always you like to process, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Yeah, so um, the advanced industry process, so we do this twice a year. So right now we're in the middle of a cycle. It opened on January 1st, and it's due on March 2nd by 5 o'clock. The next cycle will open July 1, and will close either before Labor Day or after Labor Day. I'm not sure what that date is yet, but it typically will be the first business day in, in September. And the way that uh, the process works is after applications are uh, uh, come in, we do a compliance review, and then we send it to business technical financial experts that do an independent review in our online system. They score and rank everything using a rubric, and then we convene a subcommittee in each of those seven advanced industries alongside those trade association partners that I listed there. So they're a non-voting member, they're impartial during the process, and we look at that initial scoring and ranking from the independent review, and then we down select two to four applications to move forward to our full advanced um, industry committee, where we convene 80 to 100 uh, reviewers from all of the seven advanced industry sectors, and then there's a five minute pitch with a five minute Q&A, and then we do another vote, score and rank, and then all of those recommendations go to the State Economic Development Commission for final approval. We typically grant between three and six million dollars every cycle. Uh, it is highly competitive. I have well over 100 applications right now that are in the queue. Sometimes industries, for example, technology and information tends to be uh, an industry that has a lot of applications. There can be 40, and we're only moving four people forward. Um, once you advance to the full committee day, I would say that your odds increase to get funding. We fund typically between 12 and 22 companies out of the potential 28 companies that pitch. Uh, so once you get there, odds go up. But if you're not funded for whatever reason, we will um, provide you with information that you can request feedback. We'll prepare that for you and send it to you and you can prepare an application um, the next grant cycle. I know the next this cycle is, you know, I know we're here kind of cutting, cutting it close to the deadline. Um, if you're, I would encourage you to look at the application. It is going to take you some time to complete. The way it's structured is we have you do an executive summary. You talk about your product and technology, the market size, competition. Um, you'll put together your team, their, you know, resumes. You'll put together three years of financial information. You'll do a timeline template, a budget template. You'll talk about the benefits uh, to the state in terms of job creation, job retention, any capital investment. You have to get letters of support. So it's it's similar to, I would say, if you're doing diligence with an investor, but not as intense. So we're sort of that first little step for you. Like, if you can't answer any of our questions in our application, you're not going to raise money. You're not going to be raising money anytime soon um, because they're going to ask for all of that information times 10, and it's going to be probably a more intense process for you. So I always say this is a great opportunity to get yourself prepared, set up for when you start raising raising money. Um, so that's how the application is structured. Again, it's due on the second. If you haven't started it, I would take a look at it. If you can't put in a really strong competitive application because you know it's down to the wire now, I might wait and, and apply in July. And I say that because the review teams that are reviewing Again, there's in the room 15 to 20 people. You're exposing your application to those 15 to 20 people. And if it's, you know, if you're throwing it together at the last minute because you're excited about this opportunity, it won't be as competitive. They might think it's too early. And the next time you apply, it might, 
might still not be as competitive. So you want to put your best foot forward. And so you may have poisoned the well. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to have you go through that experience. So just my words of advice, I certainly want to encourage everyone to apply, but I also want you to be thoughtful and think about when the timing is. And if you're really early and um, as well, you know, again, we do this twice a year. July is right around the corner. Just wait until you are ready. Your product is close to being ready for the market. Um, you have an MVP built. Uh, so all things to take into consideration. There's some like top things that, you know, are relatively common reasons that people don't make it past that first round or that don't get funded as a result of the pitch that we could share. Yeah. I would say um, just be realistic in your application. These people are, you know, CEOs and founders that have started companies, they've scaled companies, they've raised money. They, if your plans and you're going to create, you know, 100 jobs, right, it's just, it's not real. And they all just go, do these people know how they're going to scale this company? It's just not realistic. They don't want fluff. They want to see, this is my plan, this is what I'm going to utilize state funds for, this is how I'm going to accomplish it. Um, so that they are doing, you know, the best mm -hmm. diligence with taxpayer dollars as possible. So again, we don't want to see 68 jobs created, 100 jobs. If you create two jobs with a quarter of a million dollars, super. We know once you go to raise more money, you'll be adding more jobs. And that's really the path that, that, that's happened. So that's one thing, be realistic, no fluff. People wade right through it. There is competition. Do not say, we do not have any competitors. Because I can tell you, our reviewers, they, they spend extra time on their own. These are all volunteers, no one's paid, doing their own diligence saying, well, oh, I actually found like five people that are also doing this. So, you know, there are there is competition out there. If you have like a unique value proposition or something that differentiates you, you need to really communicate that. What is different than what's already being done in the market and how is this going to be disruptive or how is this going to impact Colorado? You know, again, we love to see emerging technologies. But, you know, I can tell you like for bioscience, for example, Early on, um, our bioscience community was used to funding like medical device and pharma, and digital health came on. And everyone's like, we're not funding digital health. Like everyone was opposed to it. And so now I can tell you, we're seeing a ton of digital health that's getting funded because that's what people are using now. So that, um, let's see, what are some other things? Uh, grammar, spell check you know, you're asking for a quarter of a million dollars, utilize the character spaces. There's 5,000 character spaces for the executive summary for a reason. They want you to see that you spend the time filling all of that out. I have some people that they think brevity is better and they just put in a few sentences and people just think, well, they didn't put enough effort into this. You know, a quarter of a million dollars is a lot of money. So they want to make sure that it's going to the most appropriate, um, yeah, the most competitive applications. Uh, let's see, what else? It, you know, again, letters of support. So if you have any um, like customers or um, anyone that supports supports you, um, those are always great things. If you, oh, I failed to mention, if you don't have the match at the time of the application, you can apply for what's called conditional approval, which allows you six months to obtain the matching funds. So our review process is about 10 to 12 weeks. Applications are due on March 2nd. We will um, give awards out in mid-May, May 20th, May 21st, that timeline. So you would have until November to raise the full match. You just can't obligate any of the state funds. We won't reimburse you for any of that until you show a full $500,000 match. Yeah. So you can take that conditional approval out to the market and mm -hmm. helps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it can be used as a leverage. So, hey, I got this two hundred fifty thousand dollar award. Like, will you? I will say though, we are starting to really look at people's fundraising plans. We want to see that you've started before our application because diligence takes a long time. This is just an observation and a suggestion that this, for something that, for the state to work on, and I think it would greatly help you know economic development here in Colorado. We need investors, VCs that can do larger rounds. Yeah. It's a huge hole in the ecosystem. We don't have it. It's holding back the state. Uh, it's cre it creates all kinds of dislocations. Um, you know, our very best companies, emerging companies, don't get funded by Colorado investors. 
Because if you, if you want to raise a large round, you have to go out of state. And if you want to find a lead investor, if you're going to VC route, you have to go out of state. And that is, um, I think, a major issue in Colorado. And it really holds us back. And I think that's why Silicon Valley and you know, maybe, maybe you know, place on the East Coast, New York City, Boston, like, you know, they, they, even though they're really expensive and there's a lot of downsides to locating your company there, but the money's there. Yeah. Um, that, I appreciate that comment. Um, we are aware that that's an issue here, that there, I mean, there is pockets of capital here, but I think, too, that rounds are getting larger, too, so seed money, that's not... It, you know, it but seeds it, are cha- that amounts changing, and so, but but I I hear your point. I, we work with Rockies Venture Club very closely. Their angel investment group. I know that they're concerned about it. I know that our bioscience association, um, they're not quite ready, but there are different groups of people that are working on initiatives and how we can look at the capital stack here in Colorado and yeah. increase that funding, but. Point taken. I hear it all the time. We we know it's uh, there's only one fund in Colorado where you, where you can you know maybe if you get a meeting with them you can raise a larger round. Yeah. By that I mean you know maybe two and a half to five mil. Right. Plus, that's it. There's one fund. Yeah. You know, and um, it there you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's not unique to Colorado though. Eighty percent of all these funds go to either of the coasts. Another eight percent goes to Boulder. The other twelve percent is split amongst the rest of the country. Yeah, but you, you you know in Boulder it's it's kind of tech stars and they sort of have a monopoly, you know um, you know with their program there's nothing wrong with their program but just having just a more diverse ecosystem and just having competition and a really diverse funding environment would help our state so much yeah. because you know you, you can raise seed money here you can get a you know quarter million or a half million but a larger round yeah yeah we we know. That that's a challenge. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. We hear it. I don't know that we. I don't know how we we would necessarily address it, but we are listening, and there's people that are looking at it and trying to brainstorm ways to to change that. So, any other questions? We were clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, again, thanks, Jessica and Sergio. Um, happy to always come up and visit Longmont and uh, share our expertise. If anyone else is ever interested in hearing about any other programs in the state of Colorado, we're happy to share our colleagues' names and um, and help. Thank Thank you. Thank you.